Please be seated. And let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 19 this evening. Remember that chapters 17 and 18 uh, recorded for us the destruction uh, of religious Babylon and then commercial Babylon. Chapter 17, the destruction of religious Babylon. Chapter 18, the destruction of commercial Babylon during the Great Tribulation period. And uh, how God takes and and uh, brings his judgment on this ungodly use of religion, this ungodly uh, use of politics and and commerce, and this uh, man-made manipulation and use of of religion and uh, money-making to uh, take a place in human lives that belongs only to God. And he doesn't like it, and one day he's going to uh, judge it. What a price this world has paid uh, for those two ungodly systems through the years uh, toward the kingdom of God, however socially acceptable uh, they are uh, today. Uh, God does not like them, and he will one day judge those systems. Uh, When he judges the systems in chapter 17 and 18, the reaction on the earth was weeping. You remember the kings wept and the merchants wept and and, uh, the sailors wept over the destruction of these uh, systems. And there is a completely different reaction that occurs uh, in heaven at the destruction of those systems. Notice in chapter 19, verse 1, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, uh, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. And so you've got this explosion of praise that occurs in heaven at the destruction of these two uh, systems. It's a great multitude. The worship that occurs, I mean, it's just this spontaneous thing that happens in heaven. It's so loud that it's, it's thunderous. I mean, heaven is really, really happy over the destruction of these two systems. Just imagine, uh, you know, college football. It's a fun thing to watch. At least it is for me. Some of these stadiums, they hold 100,000 people, you know, where football is king and uh, different places. And where isn't it king these days? And uh, I'm not putting it down. I love it. I just put down things I don't love. But anyway... But uh, imagine, you know, just like uh, a thousand of these stadiums holding a hundred thousand people exploding in, in just this uh, praise over some athletic endeavor or what are all at once. I mean, you've seen a crowd just boom, you know, somebody just uh, when Texas scored on USC. Uh, well, I don't mean to bring that up for USC folks, but um, uh, sorry, Jerry. But I really didn't mean to bring that up. And Jerry played for USC. And uh, I love Jerry. So anyway, but, but football is so exciting. And just the explosion and that kind of thing happens in heaven over the destruction, the defeat of, of these two uh, systems. And I love it. Nobody worries about anybody's feelings being hurt over this celebration of the destruction of wickedness or any of these kinds of things. Reminds me of the Wizard of Oz, the Munchkins. Ding dong, the witch is dead, the witch, witch, the wicked witch, you know, and that whole, and I mean, everybody is just thrilled in heaven. That word hallelujah is an interesting one there uh, in verse 1. It's only used four times in the whole Bible. Hallelujah, the uh, Hebrew equivalent, is used many, many times in the Bible. But hallelujah, this is a Greek equivalent of the Hebrew uh, hallelujah, used only four times in the whole Bible each one of them in this chapter, describing the celebration that occurs in heaven at the end, the destruction of these systems that have stolen the hearts and the minds and the soul and the strength of of people away from God. I remember uh, one time being in, uh, many years ago, in Romania at the time that they were celebrating their first uh, Easter after the fall of the, the dictator Ceausescu. And uh, we're driving to church on that uh, morning in Bucharest, 
And uh, uh, as we're making, I'm sorry, it might have been Brashov. But we're making our way there. Every church, there are lines down the street at every church we pass by. People trying to get into church the first Easter after his fall. And we got into one church. We were way, way up in the, you know, the nosebleed section of the church and all, and tucked away in this little corner, and everything's being sung in Romanian and all. And then they started to do a Handel's Messiah. And uh, everyone from all over the world that was in that room could track with them now because there was the hallelujah, hallelujah song, you know. And uh, so I sang like a maniac, you know. It was the only thing that I could understand in the whole room. But it's interesting how hallelujah is it's universal for praise the Lord. And uh, heaven explodes in praise uh, over all, all of this. And it's going to be great to be there. Uh, we will one day sing that alleluia. We won't just talk about it in a room like this. We will be a part as Christians of that heavenly scene. And we're going to s sing that alleluia uh, four times in the course of these events that recorded this uh, history in advance that we have in the book of, of Revelation. So work on your alleluias. Uh, make yourself sound good or, or tell people you're from uh, Calvary Chapel Merced. <laughs> we love Bob down there. I just love everybody tonight that I'm disrespecting. Now notice uh, is the, uh, this hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord uh, our God. Those four things for a while on, on, in human history looked like they were completely threatened by evil, that they would uh, be wiped out by man's uh, rebellion. But God's salvation, his glory, his honor and his power is going to have the final say in, in uh, man's uh, human history. And we say, praise the Lord to that. Now notice in verse 2, for true and righteous are his judgments, that is the Lord's judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his, uh, the blood of his servants shed by her. And so the reason for the alleluia is the destruction uh, of the harlot, God's judgment upon her. She corrupted the whole world. Uh, God says God looks at it. He doesn't say, ah, great, these are wonderful things. And, and all he looks at it, these systems is corrupting the whole world. And, the, and, and she has shed the blood of God's servants. And what did the Bible say? All the way back in Genesis, related to the law. That it, it said, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. And she has shed the blood of God's people, those two systems have, of God's people all through the ages. Because she's done that, she is then due uh, for her destruction and her blood being shed uh, also. God's judgments, once again, as we go through the revelation and, and look at them, they are not random, they are not emotional, they are measured, uh, they are righteous, they are deliberate, they are true, and they are perfect. And God could not and would not be righteous if he did not judge unrighteousness. This reminds us, and I think it's very, very important to be reminded of the fact that when God calls us as Christians to leave vengeance to him, that vengeance can be left to him. Paul wrote uh, to the church at Rome and he said, Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And I think many times we read that particular passage and all we ever see is, Do not avenge yourself. And, and remember the Bible says, Vengeance is mine. We think, Oh, that's right, rats, you know, and, uh, and everything. And we fail to see the promise associated with it. When God says, I will repay. And he will repay. And the thing about God repaying the world for its wickedness and taking vengeance upon the world for its wickedness is that he will never overstep himself. 
You and I, if we take revenge into our hands, we can become highly emotional involved in it. We can become very fleshly in it. We can end up doing things then that are worse than what was done to us. And uh, then we live the rest of our lives regretting the vengeance that we've taken. Now it can be left to God. God is going to take and and he is going to avenge the injustices done to his people for simply being righteous and faithful to him uh, all through uh, the ages leave it with him verse 3 and again they said alleluia her smoke rises up forever and ever speaking of uh, religious and commercial uh, Babylon and so there's the praise because the two systems have been destroyed and uh, the judgment of those who profited uh, from her wickedness both religious and commercial that judgment will go on forever and ever and the 24 elders and the four living creatures they now uh, fell fell down and worship God who sat on the throne saying amen which means so be it or that's the truth so when we close our prayers with amen that's what we're saying is so be it Lord answer these prayers or it's saying that's the truth in terms of what what it is that that we've prayed and so they say amen and alleluia the 24 elders as we've seen represents the church old testament new testament saints the four living creatures are each of them angelic beings and it's interesting that even the angels jump in and uh, worship the destruction of wickedness and man's rebellion and i think that they have a kind of special joy in rejoicing in uh, man's disobedience and rebellion against god being brought to an end because the one who initiated it in the human condition came from their ranks came uh, from Satan in the Garden of Eden and so they look and say from our own ranks this temptation and sin introduced into the human condition and they rejoice in heaven at his lack of, of success and then a voice came from the throne saying praise our God all you his servants who fear him both small and great and so a throne uh, a voice comes from the throne probably an angel near the throne of God calls upon everyone all of the servants of the Lord to praise the Lord for destroying wicked Babylon and then they obey him verse 6 and I heard as it were in the uh, as it were the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reigns and I like that phrase those three words a great multitude make note of them in, in your mind sometimes people think you know that uh, heaven's going to have like four people up there and uh, we're not going to know what to do with the food at the marriage supper of the lamb We'll be wrapping it up and freezing it and everything to last because it's going to be such a waste. There's going to be a great multitude in heaven. Is it, I love the fact every day I wake up and is a part of my prayers. I pray when I, I pray, our Father which art in heaven. When I say our Father, my mind is just immediately filled with all of the people that I share him with as my father and I think about the work that's going on in in our the missionaries that have gone out from this church people who love the Lord serve the Lord all over the world and every day God is endeavoring to reach every single person with the gospel and reports of his death are greatly exaggerated he is doing a very good work of drawing people to him but it'll never make the headlines it, 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 it can't, get a, can't get any traction, you know, in, in, in the media. But he's doing it. And there's going to be a huge multitude, innumerable we've seen in other places in, in the Scriptures. They can't even be counted. Hundreds of millions and then millions on top of it. And you're going to want to be there. You're going to want to be there. And if you haven't trusted in Christ as your Savior tonight, you need to do that. It's not going to be some kind of place that just a few people get to and then all the action is going to be happening in hell. There'll be a lot of action happening in hell, but you won't want to have a part of, of that. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place and zillions of people are going to be there. That's my translation of it. A great multitude. 
and the worship as it goes forth from all of us up there and all is going to be like the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering. So loud, you know, as everybody's worshiping, if you try to say something to the person next to you, they won't be able to hear you. That's great. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls and uh, it's so beautiful and you want to say, isn't this amazing? And you turn to the person... So loud, and uh, that's the way the worship's going to be up there. So remember that when the sound text maybe got things a little loud for you, that uh, he's just prepping you for heaven. But you'll have new ears up up there. All that ringing sound will be gone. That'll be nice, uh, won't it? Protect your ears, uh, you young people. So, listen, and, and, and here's the hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. That's what they, just praising the Lord. It is shout as loud as you can because God Almighty is, is the Almighty. He is the All-Powerful. And heaven just says, thank you that you are the one who is omnipotent. You are all-powerful and man is not. What if God wasn't all-powerful? What if, what, or what if God wasn't all-powerful? What if man was all-powerful? And, and God had no power to bring this rebellion to an end. I mean, that would be dismal prospect, wouldn't it? But he is all-powerful. He is all-powerful. I was reading the newspaper today. It's crazy. It's a terrible addiction. I'm trying to break myself of it. But I was watching, reading the international uh, page on things and uh, about what happened the last couple of days in Sao Paulo, where for the second time in, in just a handful of years, the gang members in Sao Paulo made a military assault uh, uh, on maybe ten different fronts uh, against uh, the military and against the police force in Sao Paulo, in the capital. I mean, a battle going on with uh, many, many people killed, many, many people injured. And you look what is happening in the world today. If the United States stumbles somehow in, in our place of prominence in the world. We are not a perfect nation by by any means. But if we stumble and leave a power vacuum in the world, that's what you're going to see go throughout the entire world. And that's why Jesus said in the last days, it'll be not only nation against nation, but kingdom against kingdom, these wars, the internal fighting within nations. And you have nations all around the world who, for all of the power and the wealth of their government, they are borderline being able to fight off kind of insurgent groups within, within their own country. And uh, so if you look at things and say, wow, if God wasn't able, didn't have the power to bring these things to an end, and now it's just going to fall into chaos into where this whole world is just looks like a expanded version of Somalia with gang lords and warlords trying to gain control of sections of the city, gaining it one day, losing it at night, gaining it in the day and losing it at night. Miserable. But the Lord's going to step in and he's going to bring an end to things before uh, all of that takes everything uh, over. So it's wonderful to be in heaven. And in heaven we're going to praise uh, the omnipotence, the all-powerfulness of the Lord. That he has the power to bring man's nonsense uh, to an end. And then um, we move on in in verse 7 to a description of the marriage uh, supper of the Lamb, the marriage of the Lamb. And he says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Now, this would mean a lot to a Jewish reader. Weddings and wedding ceremonies, they had uh, three principal um, kind of events that occurred. Uh, the first event would be sometime, if you were a, 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 a son or a daughter in your family, is sometime in your youth you would be espoused to your future husband and wife. That decision was not left to the foolish whims of youth. Uh, your parents determined that. 
God bless America. Uh, anyway, so I personally have always appreciated the freedom of being able to choose uh, my wife. So, uh, and I'm sure uh, you're glad that I chose her too. And you had the choice. So, but that's the way that it would be. I mean, the, the two kids could be three years old and three years old. And they're already, the dowry's been paid, the whole thing. It's all that she's, these two are going to be married. Now, I don't know how much of this is going on in the children's ministry today. Uh, sometimes moms more than dads can be a little premature on this, start to talk these things over um, among one another, in my experience. But that's what would happen. They would kind of pair off. That would be a done deal. And, uh, and then one day... The uh, wedding day would come and the groom would then come to the house of the bride, take her away to the wedding ceremony, and uh, they would then be married together. That marriage would, the ceremony, uh, the reception, so to speak, afterwards would be a seven-day kind of celebration. I mean, they knew how to do wedding. Can you imagine paying for a wedding? I mean, uh, then seven days feeding everybody that comes. It's bad enough to do one night. Uh, here, you know, with just, and thankfully for Costco, allows us to get by on uh, without it being a million dollars. So that's what they would do is you'd come in and all of the family, all the friends invited, and for seven days they'd celebrate that. Now, there weren't options. There weren't like sporting events and, and uh, a lot of bunch of different things that compete for your attention. I mean, a village or a town where a wedding was going to happen on that day, I mean, the buildup for that... This this would be the event of the whole year. So very, very exciting for someone to get married and somebody else feed you for seven days. And I'm sure everybody chipped in and helped a little bit. And, and so the, the, the reception would occur, so to speak, for seven days. And then at the end of the seven days, the bride and the groom would disappear for the seven days. At the end of the seven days, they would then make their appearance and be presented then to the whole group that had come to the ceremony and then move on with the you know, kind of normalcy of, of married life. That's kind of the three uh, you know, stages to the whole thing. And, uh, and so here is this description of that. We've already been espoused, Paul said. We've been espoused as a chaste virgin to Christ. The dowry's been paid. The arrangements have been made. All of these things. We're just waiting for Jesus to come back and uh, enjoy this marriage supper in heaven uh, with him. At the end of the seven days or the seven years of the great tribulation, they parallel one another then at the second coming he then makes an appearance to the world as a bride and groom would at the end of the seven days as this is my wife this is my bride and then move forward in uh, the chapter of life that would then follow that and so here you've got the harlot destroyed and uh, sin is pleasurable the bible says but only for a season only for a season, and the season is very short. So the harlot on the earth has enjoyed herself for a time, for a season, but that season is very, very short, and it gives way to all of the celebration that's going on uh, in, in uh, heaven, this indescribable joy uh, of, of the faithful bride with her groom. I don't think that there's much in life that's more beautiful than a bride on her wedding day. And, uh, and no matter what she looks like, and uh, I'm not going where Sandy went. No way. No way. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, partway through that sermon, I thought the points were very, very good. But my wife leaned over to me and said, do you notice that it's only the men that are laughing? I said, oh, boy. Oh, that's right. Okay. And it's funny, no fault of Sandy, he's a man. And, uh, and so he doesn't realize that if, if a woman thinks she has even one flaw, you know, one freckle in the wrong place, she's immediately a Leah in her mind, you know, uh, kind of thing. So everybody's tracking as if they're all Leahs. And we know no Leahs go to this church. And a lot of Leroys. Uh, but no, no Leas. He was, he was spot on about that. So I really enjoyed what he had to say about marriage and, uh, anyway, um, and, and all. But, uh, oh, so it doesn't have anything to do with the physical looks or anything, but her, 
her face just glows. I, I remember my wife's face on a wedding day. I mean, she got ripped off really bad, but she was happy at the beginning. And, uh, but I mean, here's this potential. You've waited for this day all of your life, you know, most have and all, and the excitement and all of this, and there's just something wonderful about, about a wedding ceremony and watching, watching the face of, of, of the bride. And, uh, and all, it's one of the joys really in life. It is interesting that in this marriage, it's spoken of supremely as the marriage of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb. Now, most wedding today, weddings today, if you have any sense at all, the bride is the center of attention, isn't she? She is the center of attention. That's the way that it should be. In this wedding, the Lamb, the groom is going to be the center of attention. And nobody's going to complain. Because the bride, we're just going to be head over heels in love with our Savior and our groom there as we're, we're there in that, in that place. So let us be glad and rejoice and give glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's in our future. We're going to be there with our groom. And his wife has made herself ready. For it was granted to, uh, it, and to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen and clean uh, and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And so the wife makes herself ready, and she makes herself ready by being arrayed in this fine linen, clean and bright, uh, which is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, nobody can work their way to heaven. The Bible teaches that. And, and so uh, Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not, not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. Salvation is a free gift that God gives and we receive that. So our righteous acts cannot save us. That's a free gift. And in fact, the Bible teaches that the very best that you and I do, are, when we are at our best, Isaiah declared, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We can't make ourselves worthy of heaven. But when we put our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, His righteousness, which is a perfect righteousness, is put to our account. It's an accounting term that's used there in the Bible. It's put to our account so every time uh, God looks at us, He sees the righteousness of Christ in, in, our, in our lives. But once we are saved... We obey the Lord out of a love for Him and all that He has done for us. And as we obey Him, these right deeds will one day make up our wedding gown at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's kind of an interesting way to look at obeying the Lord, isn't it? That every time we obey Him and we walk with Him, we are uh, doing a little more finishing work on the wedding gown, so to speak, that we're going to wear at this marriage supper of, of the Lamb. And uh, so no bride wants to uh, not look the most beautiful that she can on her wedding day. And it's the same with, with us as we just live a life of simple obedience to uh, the Lord in response to what it is that He's done for us, then we're going to look beautiful uh, on this uh, wedding day. We will look our best. And then notice in verse 9, Then He said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper uh, of the Lamb. And uh, so this blessing of, of being a part of, of all of this. And, uh, and he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. In other words, lest anybody would look at this and this marriage supper of the Lamb that's in our future. Oh, Lord, this is too good to be true. I wonder if it's really going to happen. And I, oh, I mean, I, are you sure I'm going to be there and I'm going to look like this? And God isn't going to change his mind on me, you know? And, 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 oh, nope. He said, here the angel declares, these are the true sayings of God. This is sure. This is in our future. As, as Christians. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> really? Now John gets very, very excited about all this. He's overwhelmed by it. And uh, uh, I mean, if you think your, your wedding day was something, this is really going to be something. And as he's seeing all of this happening, 
John says, and I fell at his feet, this angel, to worship him. Now John's like 90 years old. He's about as saintly as a person can be. I mean, he knows better than to worship angels. He just knows better than to do that. But he does it. And you know what that tells me? That tells me we're going to need a new body to be able to handle ourselves correctly in heaven. All of the blessings of heaven. He knows better than all of this, and yet this is so overwhelming. He does not have his new body, and he just says, i got to worship something, you know. And he falls down, and he just starts to worship. We're going to need a new body to just to be able to process the blessings that are going to be in heaven. And one day we're going to ha- uh, have that. The angel wasn't going to have any of this. I mean, come on. That always leads to trouble with angels in anyone, doesn't it? And he said to John, see that you don't do that. And it's got an exclamation point uh, in my Bible. He says, you know, stop it. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. That's good counsel right there, isn't it? For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So both man and angels, we are very different in a lot of different ways. But in one way, we are the same. And that is we are all servants of the Lord. uh, Different capacities and different responsibilities. And no sense in worshiping. Uh, one another, only God uh, is to be worshipped. Now this statement at the end of verse 10 is an interesting one. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The intent behind every prophecy that God has given in his word, Old Testament and, and New Testament, is to testify to Jesus. It is to glorify Jesus. This book of of Revelation here, it is not a revelation of angels supremely or miracles. It's not to lead even into the worship of prophecy and knowing all these things. It is to lead us into a greater worship of of Jesus as we see him more fully for uh, who he is. If prophecy does not draw me into a closer relationship with the Lord, then I have missed the purpose of prophecy. Remember when Jesus spoke to the religious leaders of, of uh, his day, and he said to them, John chapter 5, verse 39, if you're taking notes, he said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have everlasting life. But these are they which testify of me. They were looking at the entirety of the law and the prophets and they were saying, okay, God gave us the law and the prophets in order that we might figure out how to live a good enough life to get into heaven and and establish our own righteousness before God. And Jesus is saying, in essence, that is not why it is given. You've missed the entire meaning of the Old Testament. God didn't give it for us to establish a self-righteousness before God because that's like filthy rags. The whole purpose of the law and the prophets is to speak of Jesus, the Messiah who was to come. That's why all the furnishings and the tabernacle and in the temple and the, and the goat skins and the badger skins and every single thing about all of those things, they're all pictures of him. The whole, the volume of the book, the writer of the book of Hebrews said concerning Jesus, testifies of me or testifies uh, of of him and and so that's the purpose uh, of prophecy and then in verse 11 he begins to speak about uh, uh, the second coming of Jesus now remember uh, there would be the uh, gathering for the wedding uh, ceremony rapture of the church seven days or seven years of a marriage feast in heaven and uh, no weight gain I mean just pizza and Pepsi morning noon and night it's going to be great and a uh, few peaches and apricots just to represent some of the other food groups and, and since there's farmers in the room almonds too and, and uh, other things like, like that so you're doing God's work but, uh, so we're going to be doing that but then at the end of the seven years he takes and he's going to come with his bride back to the earth he's, and just like in the, in the Jewish wedding ceremony and that's what he does now and John said now I saw heaven opened and behold a white 
horse. Wow. Heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on this horse was called Faithful and True. So here Jesus comes back. He's going to come back on a white horse. Remember back in uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, when uh, everybody's all lifted up in pride on the earth and, and they're, in their, you know, drunk on the, the you know, uh, the, the ch- charisma of the Antichrist and all of these kinds of things and stuff. And they begin to say related to him, you know, who is able to make war with him, with the Antichrist? And here's their answer. Now, here's the one. And get ready for a whooping uh, because he, he can do it. In his first coming, he came as a suffering savior. He, he came... To, to die for our sins on the cross. But don't think you know everything about him on the basis of his first coming. There's another part of him, and it's all a wonderful, all comes together just perfectly. There's another part of him that's revealed in his second coming that is just as holy and just as loving and just as beautiful. And he's going to unfold that now. And in, in, in coming is the conquering king. And he who sat on this horse was called faithful and true. He's always faithful. He's always true. And now he's going to fulfill all of the prophecies that he didn't fulfill in his first coming. So Jesus came. And this is one of the things that perplexed the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' day. As they would read the Old Testament, all they would read was about the scriptures that spoke of the Messiah coming as a conquering king. He's going to set up a kingdom and he's going to rule from Jerusalem and and all of these kinds of things. And when Jesus came on the scene and he did not establish that kingdom in his first coming because they were completely indoctrinated with just half the story concerning the Messiah because they ignored the rest of the prophecies concerning the Messiah that said Isaiah chapter 53, Daniel chapter 9, the suffering that he would go through, that he would die, that he would rise again on the third day. All of these things, they ignored that, so they had this uh, uh, a unbalanced view of the Messiah. And, and so when Jesus came in his first coming as, as the, the uh, suffering Savior, you know, they were looking at it and say, well, that doesn't match the picture that we're, we're looking for here. But every prophecy, and he fulfilled over 300 prophecies in his first coming, And the ones he missed, there's only one reason he missed them. Because those were intended to be fulfilled in his second coming. And he will do it. He is faithful and true to his uh, word. And, And so this imbalance that even the view related to to talk with people about Jesus even today where they haven't they're not willing to accept these suffering uh, verses and in, in, in portrait that's painted uh, of the coming Messiah and in righteousness verse 11 he judges and he makes war Jesus will make war not not for no reason or just to have a war But he will make war when righteousness requires it. And righteousness requires it. He is not a strict pacifist. Because you can't be a pacifist in the face of evil. And be righteous. And be true. And he's going to to judge that. Never want to find ourselves on on the wrong side of of him. Where we look and, and... If God comes and he judges me or he brings chastening against me, it's never because he hasn't been faithful and true. It's because something is wrong, some unrighteousness in my own life. Then notice in verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire. In other words, he not only sees everything, but he sees everything for exactly what it is. He he, you know, you ever talk with people that when they see a situation in life, they, their mind goes right to the bottom line. This is the issue. They sort through all the symptoms and all the whole deal. Don't talk about that. This is what's going on here. And it's a tremendous capacity that some people have. And he has these eyes where he looks at something and he sees every person in every situation exactly for what it is. And he looks at it with perfect, perfect holiness. 
And he has, so when he comes and he judges, it's not because he's missing something or he's misunderstood uh, something. I am so glad that he's my Lord and that he's my friend and uh, he is not going to be my judge. And then notice that on his head were many crowns. Now, don't think of him trying to juggle six crowns on his head, so, you know, the kind of thing like this. It's, it's a crown and then another crown and another crown, many crowns up, up, upon his head. This speaks of his authority. And it speaks of his right to rule the world. It is a right that belongs to him and him alone. Not the Antichrist, not the beast, not the false prophet, not the devil, and not man. God wears, Jesus wears those crowns. And, and, and he is going to take his rightful place one, one day. Remember, first coming, what kind of a crown did they put on him? A crown of thorns, didn't they? It's not going to be that way the second coming. When he comes back... He is going to have a series of crowns on his head, crowns from heaven. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Isn't that something? We are going to, there are going to be things about that sometimes we think we might get to heaven and we're going to know everything about Jesus. We won't know everything about Jesus. He's infinite. We're finite. There will all be, always be mystery about him. And, and even we'll know what we need to know for heaven to be heaven. And, but here, here is this. He's got a name that no one knew except himself. That's, that's, that's kind of neat. You know, if the Lord ever tells me something or I know something, I'm going to let one of you know about it pretty quick. I'm not good at keeping kind of these things to myself. And, uh, but he knows how to keep those things uh, to himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. That's not speaking of his blood on Calvary. Uh, Isaiah chapter 63, speaking of the Messiah when he comes and trampling on the unrighteous and, and, and the blood and, and all of, uh, of these things as he comes in his judgment, comes in his fury. Remember in Revelation chapter 14. It spoke about uh, the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and he gathered the vine of the earth and he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. It's speaking about the blood that will be upon his robes when he comes in his judgment. No one in their right mind wants to be his enemy. And there is no need for a single person in this room or in this world to be on the wrong side of Jesus Christ. This thing that's going on here is, is the easiest thing to avoid in all of the world because he's paid a price to allow that to happen. And his name was called the Word of God. We use words to communicate, don't we, to reveal. Jesus is the greatest communication of the Father. The greatest revealer of heaven and the things of the Father that the Father has made to man, to us. Hebrews chapter 1. God who at various times and in different ways spoke to us in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Thank you, Lord, for that. He has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed to be the heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He is the word of God. The revelation of the Father. And then notice in verse 14, and the armies in heaven. So he's going to come back with an army or armies. We will constitute at his second coming, not only his bride, but we will be a part of his armies as, as Christians. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white Horses, And so that's us. We are the armies in, in heaven. So Jesus, when he comes at the time of the rapture, he comes. He never sets foot on the earth at the time of the rapture. He comes. We go up to be with him. And then at the second coming, we come with him from, from heaven. And uh, as a part of this army, we will accompany him as, as one of his armies, but we will not even lift up a weapon 
The battle is not ours, our battle to fight or, or, or to win. It's, it's a battle between sinful man and God, and Jesus will do all of the fighting. And so they follow, we will follow him on white horses. So apparently when we get our new uh, bodies, people say, are there animals in heaven? Will I see my little Fifi, uh, the little French poodle, the little mutant, you know, as Ken Ham would call it or whatever. But we know there are horses in heaven. And, uh, and we're all going to be expert horsemen uh, at, in, when, in, in our new bodies. One time it was a kind of a ridiculous thing. It was wonderful, but it was, um, uh, uh, people had no idea of how incompetent I was. Uh, a group of friends, they, the brothers, they uh, got together to ride some horses up to Kennedy Meadows. And, and all and uh, and one of the brothers had invited me uh, to come along with them I, I had ridden a horse I think about twice in my life uh, and one of them was one of those broken down horses at not very farm you know it just it kind of plods right along and I've been on a horse for about five minutes riding across a nice soft orchard and uh, in Napa, California. And so here we are. I'm on this, this beast. I mean, these are powerful animals and all. I'm not very comfortable related to it. I don't know how do you get left, right, back, to all this kind of... So we got to this place where there was like this ledge, and there's probably six of us on horses and all. And we're kind of bunched up a little bit there. And I'm thinking, you know, these horses might get a little spooked and all. Shouldn't we be... Just to keep, let's just keep moving. But, you know, I'm too cool to say anything about it. And I'm just, you know, uh, let's keep... Uh, I, don't like, I don't like to be here there's a ledge and it's a long way down from this ledge and all and if this horse acts up I don't know what in the world to do with it so we're all just people just sitting there taking pictures and enjoying themselves and yeah hey Ralph and uh-huh and okay uh-huh, and all every, and, and everything and I'm sitting there and my horse starts to back up a little bit but I know how to stop that so I just pulled on the reins this horse is backing up toward the ledge. It's backing. It's just stone. And, you, and you're hearing the metal of its hoofs on the stone. It's backing up. And so I figure you make them stop, you just pull on the reins. That makes them back up. I didn't know that. Nobody told me that until I'm backing my horse off of the Sierras. <laughs> So somebody looked over at me, and there's a couple of, one fellow's in the room right now. God bless you, Tim. So I, I didn't, oh. Anyway, so uh, somebody looked over there and said, uh, you know, hey, Pastor Damien, don't do that, you know. Give him a kick and move forward, you know. And I almost had, I just kept on going right back. What's going on here on this thing? <laughs> you know, on the thing. But wait till you see me in my new body. Yeah, okay, you know, just kind of hitting down that thing, you know. Just going to, you just watch me, fellas. You've got that thing there, and you got good go. And so it's going to be good for all of us. Anyway, where are we in this Bible here? On the, verse 15. So out of his mouth goes this sharp uh, sword with it that he should uh, strike the nations. Now you think about this. This is heavy. I mean, you think about Jesus. He spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. What, what have you ever spoken into existence? I haven't spoken anything to existence. What do you want? What would you like? Alexis? Eric, okay. I'd like a nice gold Lexus for my friend. Alexis, let there be Alexis. Anybody seeing it? I can't speak anything into existence. I can't speak a marshmallow into existence. There is such a gap between God and us. And he takes, by his word, he speaks the whole universe in, into I I existence. And, and then now, that's how powerful his words now are. And now on the earth, they're going to experience the power of his word, but in judgment. No thank you. No thank you. I don't want to be on the receiving end of, of that. I don't know what Jesus is going to say. When he comes against those three gigantic armies that have gathered together to fight against him and rebel against him and all. But in one sentence out of his mouth, they are wiped out for a distance of hundreds of miles. I never ever want to face his word uh, in, in, in that way. So that's how he's, he's going to come back. They're not going to nail him to a cross. Not a second time. There's no chance of that. He came to do that for our salvation. But the second t time he comes back as the King of kings and, and the Lord of lords. won't be a literal sword coming out of his mouth. It will be his words. And then we're told 
that he's going to rule.